modern tools can create great results in what they create, but there are artisans who use old tools that can also create really great items also. Sometimes you can't tell the difference. So it's not necessarily the tool you have to use, it's how you use the tool. So welcome back everyone to the down with Stan Ehrlich, who's been trading the market for, since 1971. Stan, I look forward to talk with you about trading, your perspective on things, how you trade different things, and uh, kind of talk about your experience. So welcome on the podcast. Good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So I want to begin and I kind of want to talk about how you began trading. Now, this is a few years ago. So tell me about kind of how you got into trading in the first place. So you're interested in a little history of uh, my experience in the industry. Definitely. It's been almost 53 years. Back in 1971, I was in the last year of college and my uh, parents got divorced and suddenly I had a new stepbrother. He happened to be a commodity futures broker and he offered me a summer job. And he said, would you be interested in being a runner on the floor of the exchange? And of course I said, what the heck's a runner and what do you mean by exchange and what is a futures contract? So I knew nothing whatsoever about the industry in any way, shape, or form. But during that summer, between probably junior and senior year, I became a runner on the floor of the Franklin Street Mercantile Exchange, just torn down now, where they actually had chalk boards. And you're a little young for this, but chalk boards are when they used to write literally on the wall of the exchange the prices they got from the pit brokers, to the employee of the exchange, to the guy standing in the pulpit, and then he would hand signal and yell to the guy who would write the prices on the chalkboard. Well, it was approximately 71, 72 when the electronic stuff started to take over. I became a commodity futures broker in 1972 with Conti Commodity Services in Chicago. Worked in the Board of Trade building about 13 years. And during this time, the company, which was Conti Commodity Services again, a subsidiary of Continental Grain Company, the world's largest shipper of grain, uh, owned by a Frenchman, Michel Freiburg, were the catalyst to the shipping of a lot of U.S. grain to Russia because they had a drought and we didn't. And our excess grain was holding prices down. All of a sudden, we sent all of our grain over to Russia. We're nice guys. And we had a drought. Historically, the all-time high of soybeans, for example, used to be $4.44 a bushel, <laughs> a little on the low side. Within approximately a year, it got to $12.90, screaming higher, very similar to a little year, about a year ago with the wheat market because of Croatia. I meant not Croatia, but Ukraine, the war. If you take a look at that chart a little over a year ago, it screamed straight up. Look at this incredible move up as the war began, and the time frame was approximately March of 22. So this is what I started out in the industry doing, was watching markets go screaming limit up almost every day for about three weeks because of the Russian grain deal and our droughts that were happening. So I was kind of spoiled purple. I didn't know too much. I was just brand new in the business. Approximately at that point in time, the company had a TV program called Ask the Expert. Ask the Expert. Of course, I was no particular expert at the time. And I was on the program several times, and a local guy in Chicago, Jake Bernstein, arranged a lunch meeting with me. Real nice guy. We became very good friends. He got me interested in cycles. During the 1970s, 80s, and into the 1990s a little bit, there are four people in the United States that were known for cyclical analysis. John Ellers, he was on the international lecture circuit with me and spoke about rhythms, cycles, and markets. Also, Walt Bressert, I think he fled to Mexico. He did something wrong, <laughs> although a nice guy. Um, there was Jake Bernstein, and guess who? Me, Stan Ehrlich. I happened to come up with an idea. This stupid little plastic device 
is the original Ehrlich cycle finder. There are approximately 20,000 of these floating around the world. All you do is lay it on a paper chart. Remember, there was no internet. And in fact, I used the very first technical analysis software um, for a decade or so. But what you do is lay this on a paper chart and expand it and contract it across the tops or the bottoms. Flip it upside down across the tops, the prices, the bottoms, and expand it and contract it. And sure enough, the points of the tool are going to line up with a series of lows. All you do is shift it into the future. I mean, it's so simple, it's ridiculous. Um, but it's like giving candy to a baby. He doesn't give it back. This person is technically oriented, cyclically interested in rhythms and markets. And this was it. This was the only item. I am the inventor of the oldest technical analysis device in the investment industry worldwide. I just love saying that. <laughs> and it's now been a half a century. That's <laughs> kind of crazy. But that's it. I, oh, Art Lavalle used to own Commodity Perspective, a paper chart service mailed weekly. And on about 10,000 people, I think, subscribed to his service. He said, Stan, I hear you got this little plastic thing. Why don't I sell it for you? I'll keep half the money and you keep half the money. So I'll be your advertiser. We sold anything from a few a day to about 10 or 20 a day sometimes for years. There's your 20,000 sales over a decade plus. Um, it was incredible. And during this early year or two, and that's about 1977, other people began to find out about it, and I got asked to start speaking on the lecture circuit. So I know um, Jake Bernstein, of course, my old friend. I'm a chapter in his very first book uh, and in other approximate 20 other books now. I got to meet and learn from George Lane, Mr. Stochastic. I got to learn and find out how to use RSI, which is my favorite indicator, from Wells Wilder himself. And uh, John Bollinger, Larry Williams, and a lot of other names. There were approximately 50 of us or so that would see each other at the airports or the hotel at various places in the United States and everything from Dubai to Singapore. Been around the world a couple of times on somebody else's ticket. And once it was first class. Now that is kind of cool. So the early cycle finder changed my life. As time passed, and I was a broker at the time, uh, I would be selling these at seminars that I was part of, and I would then get the person's name, an address, and phone number. There was no email. There was no Internet in the early late 70s or in the very early 80s. I don't even know exactly when email really came to be. What, late 80s, somewhere in there? So I would pick up the phone and say, Hi, John Doe. I'm Stan Earl, like I sold you the tool in Florida or New Orleans or Las Vegas or whatever. And he said, yeah, that's great. Um, uh, how can I help you use the tool on a market of your choice? About 60 seconds later, I had a new client. Boom. Just that simple. So I did very, very well in the brokerage industry. Plenty of clients, including Bob Prechter, the Elliott Wave Theorist, was a client of mine. Beatrice Foods Corporation, Santa Swiss Miss Chocolate. And oh, this is a good one. A bank out of Denver, a mortgage institution, opened an account with me. And on one particular day, we traded round turn 1,000 bond futures contracts. That's a good number. Paycheck time, I bought a Volvo station wagon with cash for the family. So I've had tons of great experiences. So as time passed, I was traveling once every few months to some big city, nice big fancy hotel. Air was covered, hotel was covered. I got to sell my cycle finder. How good could this get? And I got to yakety yakety about uh, market analysis cycles a little bit about psychology here and there. And as time passed, I became uh, the owner of an independent brokerage firm. It was my firm, Early Commodity Futures, for approximately a decade. Uh, let's see. I was also speaking for Trade Station, which used to be called Omega Research before nine, uh, the year 2000 at all three of their major conferences, which was Orlando, Las Vegas, and New York in that order. 
uh, CNBC three times. There's a, a book and is John Murphy. His book, uh, Financial, what is it? Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets, I believe. Have you got it? It's about 400 pages thick. It's a big, thick book. I've seen it. Yeah, it's a pretty big book. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, look in the table of contents. <laughs> the Ehrlich Cycle Finder is in there, page 400 and something or other. I asked Murphy, how come I'm out page five? And he said, I got something else to write about, <laughs> not me. So I met all these guys. It was a kick. We all got to yickety yak about our particular expertise. I became known as the cyclical analysis guy simply because of this silly device, the Ehrlich Cycle Finder. I now have an electronic version called the Ehrlich Cycle Forecaster uh, for TradeStation, and we'll get to some TradeStation charts in a few minutes here. And I'd like to show you what I've been developing the last approximate 12, 13 years, or, um, ER signals, automated trading system. You have some technical analysis techniques yourself, right? Some tools that you offer to the trading public, correct? I kind of wanted to ask you too, like, do you use the same principles you had back then that, that you used today, or is it like different things? Were they like different now? Or? Well, I didn't know anything back then. <laughs> so uh, it was a learning curve for give or take a decade or 15. And the lecture circuit helped me immensely learn directly from the people that came up with those ideas. John Bollinger Bands, Larry's Presenar, and George's Stochastics, and uh, Wells's RSI. Over time, I chose a relative strength index, very simple, straightforward, uncomplicated tool to use. But may I present a concept for you? These days, of course, and you could say this at any point in history, modern tools can create great results in what they create, but there are artisans who use old tools that can also create really great items also. Sometimes you can't tell the difference. So it's not necessarily the tool you have to use, it's how you use the tool. So I use RSI, it's a custom version. I don't look back 14 days, I look back less. I like a higher uh, overbought condition and a lower oversold condition. And I tweak the representation of the RSI differently. It's certainly not a line chart anymore. I also like to know what the RSI high is on the high tick of the day, not on the close, not on the current quote, did it get to my custom RSI level at any one point, a tick or more, during that day? If that's true, it's part of my setup. And again, I'll get to this in a few moments. There's one other very simple addition to the ER signals, and that is a bullish or bearish engulfing candlestick. Now, candlesticks didn't exist in the United States until around 1985. Why? Hey, we all used green monitors or black and white monitors. There was no such thing as color monitors. So finally, when Gates came along with Windows 1, you, you could get a color monitor and you'd see color in your screen. Whoopee, yay, something new. And that's a major reason why candlesticks started to become popular. They were around, they've been around, I don't know, what, 200, 300 years or more? In Japan, they used to use candlesticks to chart the price of rice. So um, during this lecture circuit, I traveled a heck of a lot, had a heck of a lot of fun, a lot of, a lot of, met a lot of people, and then the brokerage firm occurred, and I was my own brokerage company, an IB, independent brokerage. Um, then I decided to retire around 2000, a year or two after, somewhere in there. Uh, the lecture circuit had started to die out. Um, it wasn't the same circuit as it was before, same people providing the seminars. The economic structure of it changed tremendously. Nowadays, a lot of these new shows, the money, money shows and so on, the uh, general public can attend free of charge, and the exhibitors and speakers have to pay to get a spot to lecture and or exhibit their material, which could be books or, in my case, the cycle finder, market letters, whatever. 
Um, so in the old days, I actually got paid to travel the hotel and everything else. And frequently, the presenter, or the organizer of the seminar series over the weekend, you arrive on a Thursday night, um, you made sure everything was good and working right on Friday, and then started up on Friday evening with a cocktail party for everybody, that kind of thing. Then you had a couple of speaking spots on Saturday morning, a couple on Saturday afternoon, a couple on Sunday morning, and people started to fly home on Sunday afternoon. And that was the circuit. So I, one of the speakers would have usually two spots, and they were typically an hour, maybe two hours each, uh, on like Saturday morning and then afternoon, or maybe Saturday morning and Sunday morning, something like that. The rest of the time I had uh, to exhibit my material in the exhibitor's hall and or be a tourist. So frequently people would come up and say, hey, uh, can I take you out to dinner? So the food <laughs> was most of the time free. Can I go on with whatever? Everything was, it was fantastic. I just loved it. Now, Everything's changed, of course. Now it's like this between you and I. Um, and you don't have to jump on an airplane. <laughs> Not that that's all that bad. I like to travel very much. Um, lived in Singapore for a year. So at one point, while I was president of a Forex trading firm called Solid Gold Financial Services from, I believe, 02 to 06, um, 07, or 3 to 8, somewhere in that five-year period, uh, a couple of the clients were watching me teach the brokers in the office technical analysis, and I was talking about the market letter I was writing. I've written five different technical analysis market letters. This one was, was with Dan Zanger of chartpattern.com. Uh, my, my, my letter was the Ehrlich report next to his Zanger report. But uh, while I was teaching it, the track record for this market letter was evolving into approximately 100% a year. So the two clients in the office, one a vascular surgeon, another guy from Monaco, uh, they call themselves Monagasks, said, hey, Stan, we got a chunk of money each. We would be interested in you managing our money. So they made me a hedge fund manager. That's the biggest title you can have in this industry, pretty much. Um, after those experiences, uh, I thought, again, I was going to retire. Our company was small. The government said, hey, we need five million more dollars from you. And the owners of the company, a Chinese group, never came up with the funds. So the company, we closed our doors. But then I found out about Online Trading Academy. Have you heard of them? OTA? Well, for a couple of years, I was an instructor with OTA. And they sent me to Dubai. They sent me to Singapore for a month where I lived. And that was fun. I love the food in Singapore. It's just great. Um, pepper crab, chili crab, right? That's their famous dish. And uh, anything seafood, for that matter. So I spent some time there. And everything from Shangshong, north of Korea, uh, Beijing, Hong Kong, and uh, Hunan. A lot of people don't know where Hunan is, except that's where the virus started. <laughs> and I wasn't there. I was not responsible for it. I, I didn't do it. So um, you name it, Kuala Lumpur. Here you go. You like my little stories. This is a good one. So I was invited to be a speaker at a seminar that was partly in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And during the seminar, I usually ask people to come to my booth and bring a chart of your choice, and I'll put my super-duper little plastic tool on the chart and see if I can find a cycle for you. This gentleman pushed his way through a small group of people in front of me and dropped a rather large chart on the table that I was using. And it was probably three feet by four feet. So that's pretty good size. And I was written in his language, Malay, I guess. And uh, I had no idea what the chart was of, but I could tell immediately that it was a, a real chart, real price action. Some particular commodity I wasn't particularly familiar with. I didn't recognize the price movements up and down. 
I'd been doing it already for 30 plus years. He'd figure I would notice. So I picked up the cycle finder tool and I laid it flat approximately a foot or two above the chart standing up and I kind of figured out, you know, where I might expand or contract this and I dropped it on the chart and it just dropped to a cycle perfectly. It was like I spent a half an hour doodling around trying to get it to work right. It immediately revealed visually a rhythm on that particular chart. The guy was startled. I Frankly, I was a little started, startled. And everybody else as well, standing around watching. He immediately bought two cycle finders, one for himself and one for the secretary. And he asked me if I was interested in going fruit bat hunting with infrared rifles at night. <laughs> and I turned him down. I wasn't particularly interested in that sport. So um, that was kind of amazing to to find you know, instantaneously on a chart I never saw before. I couldn't even read it. And you know what the chart was? Palm oil, right? There's palm oil in Malaysia, right? It's a big export. So he happened to own a big plantation that created a lot of palm oil. So that, that's just one of innumerable uh, stories. After Online Trading Academy, I kind of settled into working out of the house and doing some coaching and uh, teaching people analysis. So you mentioned engulfing candles and that's something I use a lot in my trading too. So I'm curious to hear how you use it. Here we go, here we go. So let me change my screen indexes for a moment. This is stock market indexes. It's got the major stock market indexes and you're looking at the March. Good. And now in the upper left hand corner, you got daily data chart on the spider in a one minute. You got the DIA daily in the one minute. You got the uh, Q's, QQQ, and then daily in the one minute. And down below, you got the March E-mini futures contract daily and the one minute. And that was, you know, today. Uh, here you got the Russell 2000 and so on. So everybody loves the E-mini. That's why I have to accommodate. And let's open this chart full screen. Oop, 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 oop. I didn't want the one minute. I'm going to, I wanted the daily. And here's the... Marchy Mini Daily. Now, you know that being a futures contract, you uh, only have a life of a certain amount of months or year, two years at the most. Very few of them live longer. But everybody trades because futures is basically a short term trading type of a market. Hedgers can hang on for many months, but still, they, want, they need to roll over contract months. So I'm looking here at only what? Something from last summer, July uh, until today. All right. When you see red, that line right there, or green, that right there, or red right there, red stands for sell signal, ER, sell signal, ER signals, or a buy signal. It's just simple as that. We have code that changes the color of the vertical bar. You're not looking at a candlestick red or green and I am going to leave this at this vertical bar chart at the moment because uh, I grew up with vertical bar charts and you very well know the vertical bar charts are exactly the same data as a candlestick. The only difference is the, the opening and the close of the bar is fat to represent the body and what remains above and below the body is called a wick, which is a simple line. Uh, so if the body is green, that means the top of the body is the close of the day and the low of the body is the opening of the day. Did I get that about right? Yes, I did. Yep, bingo. So pretend the damn thing is a candlestick. Maybe I can get to a candlestick chart or maybe the next time you interview me. Next time. So on this vertical bar chart, what we have is a bearish Japanese candlestick. The closing price right there is the body, a, a bottom, uh, the low of the body. And the opening, which is right up there, a little tick mark, is the high. So you have a very small little teeny wick up there and a little tiny one at the bottom. But the important thing is, is that above the previous day's high? Just say yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Got to hear you. Loud and clear. Is the low lower than the previous day's low? 
Yep. Good. So this is in what we used to call an outside trading range day or key reversal. And now we just call it a bearish candlestick. So if you have a bearish candlestick, which is normally a sell signal on the average, so that's why people recognize it, and it says the market's supposed to start going down, and you have my custom RSI, yeah, good, I grabbed it, index, and it's overbought above the red line. That's not 70, that's 75. At the high of the day, price-wise, did it register a calculation on the RSI scale of above 75? Is the answer yes. You have an overbought condition, my custom code, but it's a variation on Wells Wilder's original. I plot the high of the RSI during the day, I plot the low of the RSI during the day, and I plot the close the old-fashioned way with a tick mark. It looks like a high-low close chart, but it's not. So again, if the high of the RSI is overbought at any tick during the day, and it could be you know half the day, it could be most of the day, or it could be one tick, it will change my prices red if the price action is also a bearish engulfing. Did you get it? Yeah, interesting. Keep watching, please. I'm serious. Okay, we got a sell signal at the top day of the market, period. This is almost a low day. It is a bullish engulfing in oversold condition below 25 at the low of the day. Unfortunately, I'm not getting them at every turn. I don't know of a system that does. But watch how often, in the examples I'm about to show you, you're going to see green at the bottom and red at the top, or very close. Red at the top. Now, that's just in the last several months. We picked two important tops and an important, I'm sorry to say, not the lowest low, but this is, okay, I'm going to pull the RSI subgraph back down. And I'm going to resize it for a second so that I'm going to grab the spider, the SPY, which of course is the S&P 500, but it does not expire. We can go back to, I think, 1983, I think, to see when the S&P SPY, it's an ETF, started trading, which was, I have to tell you, uh, 93, 83, 30 years <laughs> after I've been a broker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been around too damn long. Well, anyway, pulling the chart to the left or to the right, if you wish, what color is that? Green. What does that mean? It means buy it. Now, I have very succinct, exact, specific, unyielding rules as exactly how you get into the trade and an immediate simultaneous placement of a protective sell stop when you're long, a sell stop, commonly called a stop loss order, but I hate that phrase, it's not a loss if you're using the stop to protect a profit. So protective stop I think is a better phrase to use. What color is that? Red. <laughs> now these signals of mine don't always produce the October 13th low of 2022, the bottom of the bear market for the whole damn bear market, and the beginning day of the ninth of the 2023 bull market, which we are still in and just about to make new highs with. So that low right there, October 13th, on my YouTube market analysis channel, I talked about way a month plus in advance because guess what? In the last 30 years, over 90% of the time, you have a profound, significant buying opportunity. In what month am I about to tell you? In October. You do? Thank you. Thank you very much. You're a good student. And that was October 13th of 22. Um, a green. Right. Smack dab on time. I couldn't believe it was such an incredibly good signal. It was a whopper, just like I had a crystal ball of some sort. I used to, but I broke it. 
Now, this red one is not the greatest one in the world, but it's part of the topping out process. Let me drag this to the left, and we see some signals that didn't work very well. This one lasted only a day or two. A little red one right in there. What about that one? Is that is that on the high day, maybe, do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Thank you. Is this one at the beginning of a three or four day nice rally? It's not that big, it's certainly profitable, but my signals, don't even answer. <laughs> my signals are not necessarily the highest high for months and to come and months past, but they sure as heck are often exactly that. But they're also the beginning of short-term rallies that may not last more than a few days or a week or two. The secret here is once you get a red or green ER signal to trail your stop, your protective stop, quickly. So what the heck does quickly mean? too quickly and you're going to come up against the current price and get stopped out without letting the trade develop better. And these trades may last only a few days, they may last many months, depends. Obviously the ones that last many months have a very slow moving stop, you can adjust. I call it the smart, uh, smart trailing stop, STS, but it's a trailing stop. It's not a percentage of price, it is not a dollar amount behind the current quote. Uh, it is based on the way the market is moving and the relative strength index as time passes. Guess what? If you're in a bull market, a teen, and I'm going to ask you, I have nobody else to bother here. You're the only one I got questions to ask. So, right, I know it is. I got no choice. So, as the market goes higher, what do you think RSI is doing? RSI is going to be overbought. It's getting higher. It's getting closer to overbought, correct. So using RSI as a accelerator, if you will, and it's a custom version again, we incre decrease the distance between the stop and the current quote. Not only that, we also have versions of the ER signal which day trade both scalp versions. That could perk a lot of ears up of your listeners or a entry that p takes on a long-term position trade. Plus, there are two different entry methodologies. Whenever you see red or green, I'm always in a long or short trade with the ER signal system. But I may choose to use, and that was ER1 technique, ER1 always gets in the day of the signal. ER3 gets in within a few days after the signal occurs and attempts to get in at a cheaper price if we're buying uh, than ER1 did. Now ER3 may miss the trade completely. Uh, a buy signal, the green ER signal can just take off like a rocket and never retrace and just blast off, which happens frequently. But then again, I'm in. I'm already long. ER1 is in the trade. But if I choose to use uh, ER3 only, I might miss the trade, but I might get a cheaper price, which means a smaller loss if I'm wrong, and I am sometimes, of course, or a greater profit if I'm right. So we have ER, ER signals system to generate the signal. The signal can be used two ways, using ER1 technique the day of the signal, or, and, or for that matter, ER3. So I got it covered in a couple of different ways. ER1 scalp is exactly that. ER1 scalp gets out by the close. When you're in the trade, we move our stop minute by minute, automatically, period, that fast. So some trades last five minutes, some trades may last until the close. If you get in early in the morning, the start of the trading session, you may be in the trade most of the day or pretty much all the day, but it's a scalp, you're out on the close. You don't have to have the overnight margin, you got the scalp margin, but on the other side of the coin, the scalp doesn't allow for the trade to go in your, to move in your favor the next day. So you're out already. So there's pros and cons. If you use ER1 overnight version, you don't get out on the close. You hold the trade and the stop keeps being re-entered every morning 
and keeps moving with the market. If the market doesn't cooperate and the signal's bad, you get bumped out with a loss maybe. But we never take large losses. I repeat that. One of the strengths of the ER signals is we always have a stop immediately. We know exactly where we're going to put it and why, and it's done automatically, and it never has a really big loss. We're not looking at 1% of value or a certain dollar amount, which you could, but the original formula, the one I like to use for the most part, uh, uses a predisposed pre technique. So it's a little different for every trade. Depends upon the price action and the price at which the market's trading. Uh, let me go to, and that was yes, S&P daily data. Hey, I got it. Give me a commodity. Make me smile. Give me a give me a damn commodity. Come on. How about you want to have a look at Forex? Because uh, a lot of the audience is based on Forex, so it might be interesting. You, you want Forex? You want Forex? I got Forex for you. Hang on. Here's the euro dollar. Uh, no, that's the Japanese yen. I'm sorry, the dollar yen. USD JPY. I thank you very much. That's very nice of you to ask for this one. What color is that? That was the green just before. You got to go a little faster. I got red here on this top. I got red here. <laughs> I got red right there. Now that was a bad signal, granted, and that one didn't do very well. But look how many of these, and I'm going to go back to the euro dollar, for example, are at the bottom of major moves. What color is that? The teen. Yeah, green. Is that is that close, maybe, to the bottom of a multi-year bear market and the beginning of the bull market ever since then? Do you have any targets with this, or do you just let the, st the, the predicted stuff kind of run? Ah, very good question. Very good question. I don't like targets. Because if you have a target and you reach it, you tend to get out of the market. That's what targets are for. Uh, not that they're bad and not that a lot of people might use them successfully over time. But I like to get a signal and see how far it can go. So I use a trailing stop only for my exit purposes. I may be in a long position and end up getting a week or two later a sell signal. I ignore it unless I have been stopped out of my previous long already and I'm flat and then I'll go short. Now I obviously am a little concerned about this sell signal because I, I tend to believe my system but I've learned over half a century to trust the signals because sometimes they are whoppers. Major turning points for a long period of time. Now that's great for investor types which you know tend to hold on for months and months and months and forget they've got it and will it to their grandchildren and they will it to the next person <laughs> and then yeah, forever and ever right um, which is a good thing on a very rare occasion but we're talking about forex we're talking about futures for the most part which is where I started in the industry but I was also a stockbroker for a few years as I said before president of a forex trading firm for five years owned my own brokerage firm for over a decade taught technical analysis and cyclical analysis worldwide for OTA and over 150 lectures. Uh, you name it. But strangely enough, I never got below the equator. That's kind of weird. I was invited to um, Cape Town and Johannesburg, but that went through. Uh, that didn't go through. I didn't get to lecture down there. And I never got to Australia uh, or New Zealand. Singapore is two degrees above the equator, and I was there for a month. That's as close as I got. Weird. I never got to see water go backward down the toilet. You know, it goes the other way, south of the equator. <laughs> that would have been weird. How about USD CAD? Or actually, a better one, USD Singapore. Good. Fantastic. I've never seen this before. Um, oh, my God. Thank you very much. <laughs> what color is that? <laughs> a teen. Uh, you can join my group and ask questions anytime you want. You'll lead me to some great signals. What color is that? Red on top. I'm sorry to say we didn't catch the bottom of the market on that particular signal. That one's very close, green, and we just got a buy signal a week ago. Did you catch that? Did you see it? Are you long? Anyway, uh, we caught this little rally right here, and this one was a very small little break, and I should expand 
so we can actually see things a little bit better. How's that? So green, green rally for several days. Now remember, some of these are not, most of them are not the high or low for months and months to come. But this one's awfully damn good. Oh, whoop, 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 that's better. Just a few days earlier. And uh, that one's almost the exact high day. And buy near the bottom and the top day. You can plainly see in this case that it's a bearish engulfing candlestick because of the size of the bar and the closing and opening prices. Um, but again, I could load NinjaTrader and show you candlesticks, but I'm using candlestick, uh, vertical bar charts in TradeStation. Sorry about that. How about that little one there? It doesn't have to be big. It only has to qualify. And dragon, dragon. I wish I could say that I get a lot of signals very frequently, but these are quality signals. Here's another green smack dab on bottom. The market went immediately straight south, south and this is Forex. And I've never seen the Singapore, yeah, Singapore dollar. Uh, I should put this in here. Uh, USD, SGD, saved, good. What is it, the DAX, D-A-X? But that's a German stock market index. I wonder if I get that. Uh, it's a little thin, not very much. Yeah, that's not choppy, it's a little thin. Not the, not the liquidity that I would like to have uh, revealed. And so I'm not actually getting very many signals at all. That worked for only a damn day. One damn day is not gonna do you a lot of good. So this is not coming up like I was hoping. Have a look at the uh, Mexican pesos. So it's USD MXN. USD X M X N. I thought the peso was real thin, but it's not. Oh, oh, ouch. <laughs> oh, I love it. I used to do this in front of seminar people. Okay, that's only a couple of days. I can't brag about that one. Uh, let's find some red one on top or something. Now that I like, and it was a heck of a good rally, but it got complicated because of that extra green one there. This was not bad, profitable for a day or two. Another great green. Ah, thank you very much. Oh, two of them. Red on top, the high day. Red on top. Um, are you liking this? Is it good? Interesting. Yeah, it's a pair I like to trade for the trends, long-term trends. Yeah, yeah. I hope you're... Oh, 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 ouch, ouch, yellow, green on the bottom, green on the bottom. So, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this works the same on stocks, I venture to say, worldwide. It is based on the psychology of trading, basically. Not just because it's a Forex or because it's a futures contract or because it's a stock or an index. Um, they're all similar as far as this trading system is concerned. Yeah, it's interesting. Have a look at the, you might not get data on this one, but the USD Thai bot. So it's USD THB. Come on, give me something to... <laughs> give me some, give me a hard one. <laughs> oh, this is very interesting. Oh, ouch, ouch again. <laughs> Green on the bottom. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I have uh, decades of doing this at with an overhead transparency projector, where you had to use an acetate roll of clear, you know material to drag slowly across the bulb and the little light reflector would push it on the screen. And I once gave a seminar at the Summit Hotel across from the Waldorf Astoria in New York for Alexander Elder, um, the Elder Viewpoint. And nice guy. Uh, he called himself a white Russian. Now, I don't know if he drank the drink or whether he was uh, something like that, but a very nice guy. So what I was using was a, about a two inch thick plasma screen on top of the overhead transparency projector so that it was connected to my laptop. And very early in the stage of doing this, I could have real time charts on my laptop and display them for the people in the audience to see. Now, of course, you got big monitors and projection TVs and so on. But this was the early form of this. 
What I was supposed to do for Alexander Elder was trade real money, real time, in front of the audience to show them what I was doing in those days. Now, uh, you know, you're teaching, you're lecturing, you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and tell them what you told them. Standard lecturing technique. So an hour or two into the all-day seminar, I set up and watched a particular, I don't even remember what market it was, probably a major index. But I saw a trade coming, I explained why I was going to do it, and I made the trade on the telephone, real time, in front of the group. You can't push buttons in those days. This is, this is old school. I mean, really old school. So I got in the trade. The people could hear on the speakerphone the report back that I bought it at such and such a price. And we all watched for 5, 10, 30 minutes or whatever it was. And I said, well, this is the reason for me to get out. And this is why I'm going to get out. And I gave the order and I got out with a profitable trade. Well, all well and good. Yay, made one good trade. So I got in a second trade a little bit later. These are the stories you like. And it started to do well, but it fa fairly quickly started to go sour on me. Now, I still had a little bit of a profit, and I hate, and people do this all the time, especially neophyte traders, beginner traders. You turn a profitable trade into a losing trade, and it don't come back and you procrastinate, and you didn't think about where your stop was going to be. You didn't move your stop to protect a profit that you had, and so now you've got a loser, and you don't know what quite to do. Well, you, you made the trade because you believed you were right. Let me ask you, Dean, when's the last time you made a trade knowing and expecting you were going to be wrong? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, well, no, 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 don't do that to me. No, no, never, except for tax reasons, maybe. <laughs> Right. So this is what people do, unfortunately. Beginner traders don't think about their risk before they get into a trade, no matter what technique you like to use. I don't care. If you don't practice good money management and good money management skills and protect your profits, there are going to be too many losers and one of them is going to be really bad and it's going to kill your account. And you know something? Today, it's going to be the automatic computers that are going to say, oops, you're too low in your account size and we're taking you out of the trade automatically and you don't like that a darn bit. It's happened to me. And in the old days, I had to call the client. Uh, it was my paycheck that was actually responsible for covering any deficit that the client had. So I was very conscientious about clients' equities and the situation the market was in, etc. Something you don't have to do anymore. Atin, what was the name of the first technical analysis software for the home computer? Uh oh, you don't know. I'm sorry. CompuTrack. CompuTrack was written in BASIC for the Apple II Plus and the Apple IIe computer in 1977. I was a broker already for about five years when that came out. I was drawing my charts by hand on Kufel and Essler 47-18-10 chart paper that you, that you could get a pack of, about 50 sheets, at the cigar stand in the lobby of the Board of Trade. And you put them together with tape. One sheet of paper, which was about 14 inches, was enough space to draw in daily data for one year. I still have in the closet in back of me some of my original charts that are 14, 11 feet long. That means 11 years of data hand drawn day by day. And some of them are three or four feet tall. You know, the Russian grain deal made the chart get bigger and bigger and bigger, higher and higher. Some of them I gave to franchise owners at OTA. And one guy put it in a frame while I was still there. I'm usually at a place for a week and hung it on the wall down the hallway. You know, it's 11 feet long. So there are a few of them floating around the world. I think there's one in Dubai, one in Singapore. Gosh, I don't know, a few in the States. But I've got half of the ones that I originally drew. I used to bring them to the seminars and lay them down on my big table, you know, in the exhibitor's hall. And people would start to put their coffee cup on my chart. I practically shot them. <laughs> you don't want to do that to my custom-made charts. So. 
I stopped bringing them to the seminars. I had a big carpet tube about 10 inches in diameter and I would roll the charts up in a big roll and slide them into the tube and bring it onto the airplane or check it in luggage or whatever. But that's the way I toted them around the world a few times, uh, those big charts. Uh, tell people what can they find you and connect with you after this interview if they want to learn more from you or see what you're doing. Uh, people, if you want to contact me, you can email me at info at ersignals.com. ersignals, with an S on the end, dot com. Info at ersignals. That's how you reach me. I'll leave the email link in the uh, description of the video. People can check it out directly and contact you there. And Stan, I appreciate your time. I appreciate the advice you give here to my listeners. There's a lot we unpack here, and we can definitely go uh, way into it next time for sure. And I really appreciate the time you spent with uh, the people here teaching them good stuff about trading. I appreciate it.